Well, 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 we're wrapping up the first month of 2024 with PC Gamer censoring the murder of cartoon sheep. It's going to be an interesting year. Why are you the way that you are? Honestly, every time I try to do something fun or exciting, you make it not that way. By 2024 is going to be a very strange year indeed. I've got it up on the screen now. Yes, PC Gamer are censoring the murder and skinning of cartoon sheep. Welcome to 2024, everyone. Let's get into the video. I think there's an actually interesting story to be told about how we got to this point in gaming. And in this video, I'm going to try and quickly summarize it as fast as I possibly can. And at the end of the video, we're going to look at some of the ridiculous things that people have been saying about Pal World from mainstream media outlets. So here's how I see the story is going. As Pal World sales soar ever higher and gaming journalists have realized that there's a beloved gaming title out there that they have no industry connections with and this company doesn't seem to care about being canceled on their beloved Twitter or X.com. Are you allowed to say X.com in the first few minutes of a YouTube video? Because it sounds, you know, dodgy. Anyways, it's safe to say that gaming journalists are not responding well. Wait. A small Japanese company that Western journalists don't like that's making really good games. God, I'm just, I'm having flashbacks to something. But before we get to the journalistic freakout, I think there's a bit of a story that's been brewing here for ages that is worth explaining. At least that is how I see it. So stick around and please give me a chance to actually explain. So there's a saying in English that we got from Shakespeare, which is actually really relevant to gaming, which goes, hoist it upon your own petard. While hoist, and it's past tense, hoist, is no longer used in contemporary English and petards are long a thing of the past, the sense of the phrase is something that most computer gamers are readily familiar with. The idea is that you throw a grenade and... Right, so what if he's not... I'm having a fight with this fictionary man right. and he's not punching me hard enough in the face to make me go mental and win. Let's do an experiment, Barry. We'll have a fight right now, right? And when you start losing and you're not, you're not doing very well, you, you punch yourself in the face, go mental and start winning. Show them, all, show them all out. The idea is that you throw a grenade and the grenade bounces back on you. But the saying itself in terms of metaphor is not really about nades, though credit should go to Shakespeare for seeing the human frustration of the idea of a nade bouncing back and killing your teammates long before Counter-Strike 1.6 got released. Because Shakespeare really was just a genius. The saying, though, is a metaphor for someone's attempt to achieve something and that in the end, all their attempts actually do is make things worse for them. Basically, everything that comes out of Todd Howard's mouth about Starfield recently. But that's a discussion for another time. What AAA game devs and their investors have tried to do for years is engender something more commonly seen in media overall. And that is the personal identification of the user with the brand or IP that they mercilessly pump out, often at the expense of their own employees. Sometimes this ends up working, and... And sometimes, you get Kathleen Kennedy. Kennedy, the linguine and clam sauce. Uh, excuse me, I believe I asked you to put a chicken in this and make her gay? We've all seen the success of this strategy in the early days of Blizzard Entertainment. There was a time not so long ago that anything Blizzard Entertainment released was something I wanted to play. I didn't care if it was an MMORPG, a MOBA, an FPS, or a trading card game. I play Blizzard games, I thought. I shout for the horde before randomly performing tasks. When I go to do the dishes, I say, work, work. But the close bond between the intellectual property and the fans is undoubtedly a contentious relationship. And the more effort that AAA devs put into pumping out yearly sequels to COD or Assassin's Creed that ultimately end up being big empty sandboxes of busy worker just rehashing the same game over and over again, that relationship can and I think has begun to fray. And like any relationship that is in need of repair, things can suddenly collapse when someone new enters the picture. If there's something I've learned in my short time doing critiques on YouTube, it is that most people do not reflect rationally on the content of the media they consume and see criticism of it as personal criticism of how they choose to spend their precious time after work. And why wouldn't they? To quote the great Asmongold, make game fun, please. I think it's more of a paraphrase, but you get the point. People play games to have fun, not to write video essays about them. I mean, unless you're me. But back to my point, relationships may begin to end slowly, but when they collapse, it can happen in the blink of an eye. 
if the critical success of Baldur's Gate 3 was your spouse being out late at work a little bit too much, the success of Paul World is like coming home because you forgot your keys and finding her in bed with another man. How many major AAA studios have tried to release a successful survival game only to fail, many of them never even releasing in the first place, only to be blown away by a small, eccentric Japanese company with its combined sales on Steam and its players on Game Pass probably making it one of the most successful game releases in the modern era. And journalists and AAA studios are losing their goddamn minds. Now, there are some differences I need to acknowledge between Power World and Baldur's Gate 3 that I think also go some way in explaining why gaming journalists watch with glee as Baldur's Gate 3 made AAA devs sweat anxiously while freaking out absolutely about Power World. I mean, remember, even IGN covered the story about AAA devs not liking Baldur's Gate 3. And when IGN does it, well, we know we've reached the bottom of the barrel. And of course, that is incredibly rich, given that Larian have over 600 employees, three offices, and have been in the industry for years, many industry insiders inside the company, and good connections with gaming journalists, and receiving very good reviews over their past several releases. But if you're the sort of person who watches gaming drama on YouTube, you'll know that there was quite a lot of glee going around in the gaming media space surrounding the release of Baldur's Gate 3. I mean... Anyone who zoomed in on Todd Howard's face during the gaming awards has enjoyed it. But Pal World and its developer Pocket Pair, on the other hand, are a small Japanese team. Their magnitude's tinier than Larian, and they have almost no, as far as I can tell, established relationships within the Western gaming industry, or even in Japan as far as I've seen so far in my research. Their success is no doubt parasitic upon the success of the biggest bit of intellectual property to ever exist in the history of the human race, and that is Pokemon. Yes, that is, as far as I can tell, an established historical fact. As of 2024, Pokemon is the most expensive bit of intellectual property in the history of, of our race in this planet, and if we're alone, in the entire galaxy. Go and think about that for a while, and come back after you've had a few glasses of whiskey. Anyways, back to the video. And I'll come to the whole discussion of Pokemon and Pal World in another video if people like this one. But for this video, I'm trying to, I'm trying to stay on track. Stay with me. In a sense, both Baldur's Gate 3 and Power World are parasitic upon legacy media and nostalgia to an extent, Baldur's Gate 3 being the descendant of the Black Isle games and Power World being a bit of a allegedly Pokemon ripoff. But the situation for AAA devs is much starker with Power World. Larian still had had successful games under their belt, which were highly reviewed, albeit that they made it way over the head of most normies. But if you follow the CRPG space before the Baldur's Gate hype, Larian were probably the most critically acclaimed developer of recent times in the space, alongside maybe Obsidian Entertainment. Somewhere, however, there is going to be board members looking at the stats of Power World and some very nervous game directors and marketing professionals explaining why they couldn't do that at that price point. This is far from the end of AAA gaming studios, but it is undoubtable that some questions will need to be answered within these companies. Now, there's an entire story to tell about why these smaller companies are starting to suddenly make better games than what is coming out of these large AAA developers at the moment. And for that, I would point you to a video made by Tim Kane, the creator of Fallout, who made a video on this topic about a few months ago. But to summarize his wonderful insights, he claims that employees at large gaming studios have no particular responsibility to get things done. So development sits in bureaucratic hell, where developers are too scared to make the risky choices necessary to A, actually release the game on time, and B, take any of the necessary creative risks to make a good game in the first place. Everything, all the bucks, get passed further back the line. This is bad English. Continuing. But his point is that all decisions need to be passed up the chain, presumably to eventually meet investor demands and the dreaded ESG requirements, media and public relations, and all the rest. And no game could exemplify that this bureaucratic rot has become a problem more than Pal World's dev team and the eccentric way that they have created this absolutely bizarre game. But before we continue, I want to take a look at a recent article from Gaming Insider that really hits home about just how absolutely different their methodology is than that of a AAA developer. While being questioned about the game's development, the game's founder, Mizobe, 
answers several questions about the game's financing and how they could manage to develop the game at all, given their apparent lack of presence in the industry at all. The person writes, Ultimately, the game didn't get finished in a year. In fact, Mizobi says the game was quote-unquote bad and nowhere near close to being finished. Quote, I became clear that in order to realize the game we had envisioned, there was not enough manpower, money, or development time, he said. That's when I decided it wasn't worth actually budgeting the game. <laughs> the budget cap starts with a zero balance in your bank account. When it reaches zero, you can borrow money, he said. In that case, do you need to manage your budget? Mizopi said that they would borrow money and kept working on the game, hiring people and building out what they wanted Power World to be no matter what the cost. In the three years since that decision, 40 people have been hired to work on Power World, with the studio outsourcing even more help. Now, if you've watched Tim Kaine's video, and I encourage you to watch it after this one, that is such a completely different attitude towards that of many large Western developers. It is a team of people who have absolutely no idea what they're doing as a company, because I guarantee you, that is not a good monetary policy to run a large company by. They're just making a game that they found funny and interesting, and they were going to keep doing it until um, the debt, debt collectors came calling and stripping them of their stuff. And that's lovely, and we need more of that, regardless of the other controversies that Pal World has been involved in. But this is not the kind of humor that moralizing gaming journalists want. Even as I was recording this video, PC Gamer have started to backtrack a little bit on their criticism of the game, recently announcing only 30 minutes ago that Pal World is the Pokemon that this sinful world deserves. Oh, Beginning, let's be honest, if Pokemon were real today, we'd have Pikachu power stations, Poliwraths flushing fartbergs out of our sewers, Piplup's cleaning crime scenes, and a rentable Chansey subscription service for healthcare providers. Something about this game has just inspired gaming journalists to be their most cringe selves in an otherworldly lake of cringe. And, and we're all drowning in it. And it's hilarious. And I love it. But let's back up a bit. I mean, this is a bit of an insert to this video because they're, they're trying, the, the journalists, they're trying to keep up with the situation and trying to stay relevant while at the same time just being drowned in their own cringe. Anyways, back to the way I started this video so we can resolve the situation and end this in a sane manner before I lose my mind reading the things the gaming journalists have to say. So let's start with this article that I opened this video with and that we've finally gone for a circle to get back to it. Paul World could be a delight if it wasn't so invested in being awful, written by the amazing journalist Lincoln Carpenter. Shockingly, animal cruelty doesn't make for a fulfilling experience. And he begins his amazing journalistic insights with, I was morally obligated to keep an eye on Paul World. I've been playing Pokemon on and off for four-fifths of my time on this earth. I'm a card-carrying dwarf fortress weirdo. You're definitely a weirdo. Which Pal World Devs has cited as his favorite game. Ignoring Pal World would have been a dereliction of professional duty. Now that I've spent dozens of hours with it, emerging this week into early access, I can comfortably say that duty might have been fine to leave derelict. And watch how the cards have turned in the seven days since he released that article. Now they're backtracking. Now it's on us that we like Pal World so much. Gamers are bad human beings. That's why we like this game. Because they can't back down from their industry commitments that they will actually blame the players for wanting the most popular game to be released in at least, what, four or five years? The world's insane. And this is why we keep getting Starfield. This is why the latest Pokemon titles are garbage. Because these people spend all their time defending garbage for corporate interests while feigning being the moralists. If you like this insane rant, please like and subscribe. 
I think this is just one of the weirdest situations I've ever seen in the history of gaming. And I've loved every second of it. And I'll see you guys in the next video.